In this video, we have Sarah Middleton-Jones from the RBA's archives team to talk to us and share more about our photographic collection. Sarah, I cannot help but notice, despite its age, the sharpness and quality in this photo next to you. Why is that? Well, essentially, it's because this is a print that's been taken from a glass plate negative. So a glass plate negative is a specific kind of pre-paper type of negative in a way. So as you might know, a negative is essentially something where you've filtered light through a lens to something that's light sensitive to get the image. And with glass plates, they essentially took a literal glass plate and spread something on it that would be photosensitive. So there's two main types, you've got wet and dry. So we've got dry type ones, which are a bit thinner and a lot more transportable. Our collection dates from around 1914 to about 1940 and covers like a lot of the early life of the bank. So we've got some really interesting things there, such as lots of images of the early bank branches. We've got images of the construction of the bank's head office building, which you can still see in Martin Place. We've also got images from the promotion of the World War I war bond campaign. And then we've got things like staff images and social functions. So the image that you actually noticed is quite cool. So you've got, this is from a staff reunion held in 1920, and it was for the staff members that had returned from active service overseas. So they invited the staff and their family members over to Clifton Gardens, and they had this day of sports and activities, like putting competitions, sack races and speeches, and all the accounts of it, it they had a lot of fun. So I think this photo in particular really does show the camaraderie you had and how the bank staff members really thought of themselves as a family. And this photo here, it doesn't really look like the scene is set within the walls of a central bank. Can you share more about this one? So this is an example of essentially one of the travelling agencies they had where they're going out there on the back of camels or horses or buggies. So they're essentially going out there with just the ledgers and just the things they need to open bank accounts and do essentially deposits and finding whatever's available. So for example, this guy's clearly found that there's nothing useful to use nearby. So he's just sat himself down on the ground and he's using his leg essentially as a table to write his things in the ledgers. And you've got all the navvies kneeling down next to him to do their deposit slips. So the photographic collection captures a lot of significant events within the bank's history, including a royal connection. Yes. So while many people might know that um, Edward, Prince of Wales, visited Australia in 1920, what they may not realise is that he actually visited the bank's head office building at the time. So we've actually got a photograph here that shows him entering the building. So we've got the Prince of Wales in the middle being greeted by the governor of the bank at the time, Sir Dennis Miller. And they've got a nice um, honour guard down the side of returned servicemen. So you've got the Governor General at the time, Sir Ronald Munro Ferguson, who actually had an office in the building, but he was also the host of this banquet. And the reason that he decided to host the banquet in the bank's head office building was because at that time, the head office building was fairly newly constructed and the staff luncheon hall was actually a better space than any other space in Sydney to hold a really large banquet. So they decked out the luncheon hall with a lot of tables, flags, and ivy and palms around it to really set it up for welcoming the prince. But then we've also got some good photos of externally to the bank where you can see how they also decorated outside. So this was in conjunction with a lot of the buildings in Sydney, really decorated over the top to welcome the prince. The governor, Sir Dennis Miller, was chairman of the committee for decorating Martin Place and Moore Street. And you can see how successful he was in essentially coordinating this all. We have the giant lights on the outside of the building saying welcome, and you've got flags and bunting ready to greet the prince, particularly as they're doing the parade past the building. So the Reserve Bank is known for printing and distributing Australia's banknotes, but our photographic collection shows surprisingly that at one point we printed stamps. Yes, so I think this is again one of those lesser known functions of the bank that we had for quite a long time. The stamps were actually originally printed by Commonwealth Treasury. Then in 1920, it was transferred to a notes board, which was chaired by the governor of the bank and essentially under the administration of the bank. But then in 1924, the control was completely transferred over to the bank for the printing and issuing of stamps. We actually printed the stamps for over 50 years, with the final stamp to be printed by the bank actually occurred in 1981. And the main reason that we stopped was actually because the 
no tissue was transferred away from the one of the original buildings in Fitzroy over to a new building in Craigieburn, and they agreed that they wouldn't have stamp printing facilities there, and that's essentially why we ceased. But we still have over 50 years of history of printing stamps. So we've got some really interesting photos from the late 50s and early 1960s, and the stamp printing process they were using at that time. So in this first photo, you can see the intaglio printing machine. So intaglio is a process wherein they get the metal plates and they engrave the design into it. But the engravings are of different depths, so the ink sits in at different depths. So when it goes through the rollers, the lines come out at different thicknesses to create the really intricate designs you can get on the stamps. In this second photo, you can see a different part of the process. So this is the putting the perforations into the stamps. So obviously you can see that they had a machine to do it so that you got those lines perfectly straight. However, you still needed somebody to line the actual sheets up so that they were going in straight. And there were little guide holes on either side of a sheet so that you could put it in and it would line up and those perforations would go perfectly. Now this was all done by women. However, prior to this, what they actually had to do was they had to poke those holes through by hand. So you'd have a group of women sitting there and their task to all day would just be to poke these holes through these sheets of stamps so that they could put them on the perforations. So I must think they must have been pretty glad for this innovation in technology. <laughs> then you have the rather impressive and scary looking guillotine to cut the sheets of stamps. And then finally, you have the stamps that were checked. Before any sheet of stamps was sent out to the to the public, it had to be checked front and back. And again, this was essentially a job done solely by women. So you'd have a room full of women going through, checking each side of a sheet of stamps and going through, I think it was like 800 million per year. They were pretty fast and very good at their jobs. And finally, one of the last things people would expect a central bank to be doing is diving for treasure. Can you tell us a bit yes. about that? So this is actually one of my favorite stories that I've come across in our archive. So essentially, back in middle of World War II, we're looking at the 19th of June, 1940, and the ship RMS Niagara has sunk off the coast of Auckland. So it's traveling from Auckland to Suva and it had passengers and cargo and it hit a minefield and went down very quickly. Thankfully, all passengers and crew were saved, but they couldn't actually save the cargo. Now, what wasn't well known, obviously, at the time was that there was actually a cargo of gold in there put by the Bank of England to pay the US who weren't in the war at that time for munitions. Now, all of this gold was lost when the ship went down, but it's the middle of World War II and that gold was really needed. The bank comes into it at this point in that they acted as the agents for the Bank of England in salvaging this gold. So what we have here is a photo of the salvage ship Claymore. And that would essentially went out off the coast of Auckland to search for the ship. It took them over six weeks to actually find the ship to start with, during which time they found, I think, three different mines because it had sunk in the middle of a minefield. And then once they did find it, they had a lot of difficulty actually getting to the gold. So at the time, this is one of the deepest salvage operations that have been done, so at 438 feet down. And by the time they'd found the ship, they'd kind of been moving more towards the winter weather. So you've got shorter days and less light. And then you had the delicate operation of getting to the bullion room without accidentally detaching it from the ship so it drops to the bottom of the ocean floor and then you've lost all the gold. They used this, to be honest, quite rickety looking ship to do this entire salvage operation and they had what they called a bell where they lowered people down from the side to get the gold out. Now, as part of the contract that the bank had made with this salvage company, as soon as they started bringing the gold up, there had to be a bank officer on board just to essentially sure the custody of the gold. For the entirety of this salvage operation, which only finished in December of 1941, there was a bank officer on board taking custody of the gold as it came on board. And then when they made periodic trips back to the mainland, he was transferring it to the custody of the officers of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. So you have this photo here with some of the gold bars that they salvaged. And you have Mr. Neely here, who was the Commonwealth Bank officer with Captain Williams taking custody of the gold you see at the front. And on either side are two divers who are both called Johnston because they were brothers. And these were the two main divers getting the gold out. So despite all the very adverse conditions, they actually managed to salvage 555 of the 590 gold bars that went down with Niagara, which is 94% of the gold and equaled at the time over 2 million pounds. 
So yes, to essentially answer your original question, one of the most unexpected aspects of the bank's history is that we were once involved in diving for gold from a shipwreck. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing some of these amazing photographs and the incredible stories behind them. If you'd like to explore the archives further, why not visit the online archives at unreserved.rba.gov.au or the RBA Museum website at museum.rba.gov.au. Oh.